Now that we've spent the last couple of videos going through some of the principles of IR spectroscopy, what we'll do in this video is walk through a couple of practice problems where we apply what we've learned in the last few videos. So for this exercise, you will definitely want to have handy the IR spectroscopy handout, which you can find by clicking the chapter 12 module. And within that overview and introduction to the module, you'll see a link for this handout. You can also find the handout by going under files on Canvas and going to handouts. So let's take a look at some practice problems. So in this first practice problem, it says that Dr. Osprey was careless and forgot to properly label the bottle of hexanal, two hexanone, hexane, and one hexanol. For one of these unlabeled bottles, the following IR spectrum was collected. Which compounds does this spectrum correspond to? How do you make that conclusion? So the first thing we have to think about is what are the structures of the compounds that we're looking at? What functional groups are present there? And how can we use this IR spectrum to match with the functional group or groups present in one of those bottles? So hexanal, the AL suffix indicates to us that that is an aldehyde. Hexanal, hex meaning six carbon atoms. So I'm just drawing out my structure of hexanal here to show you what that looks like. So this is our hexanal. Since it's an aldehyde, we should have a key carbonyl signal present in our spectrum if hexanal is the structure that we're dealing with here. Two hexanone, that's going to have six carbon atoms in its chain and a carbonyl group at carbon two, hence the two there in the hexanone. And the way we know it's a ketone is the O and E suffix. Hexane, going way back to chapter three or so when we first learned nomenclature, hexane is just going to be our six carbon chain here no functional groups outside of alkanes, and then one hexanol, six carbon chain. And one hexanol with the alcohol group at carbon number one. So as we look at the spectrum here, what I would recommend looking at first, and remember that you can refer back to table 12.2 earlier in the handout and from our last video that gave some diagnostic signals. And the two diagnostic signals that we focused primarily on were that at around 1700 inverse centimeters, if we have a carbonyl group, we expect that carbonyl group to be there and very strong. The other key signal that we looked at was that around 3300 inverse centimeters, we would expect to find hydroxy groups that are, would be very broad. And so these are the two main things that I look for when I see uh, IR spectrum. And fortunately for us, when distinguishing between these four compounds, two of them have carbonyl groups, which should be very diagnostic in the spectrum if those are present. And one here has a hydroxy group, which should be very diagnostic if it is present. So looking at the spectrum, I don't see anything at around 1700. So if we tick off here, 1100, 1200, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, right around here, if we have a carbonyl group present, we should see a strong signal there. So I'm gonna label this as having no carbonyl because the only signal that's there is this little blip up here, which is quite possibly noise. It's a very tiny signal. And then we come on over to the left here and we see this signal right here is the broadest signal in the entire spectrum. It is tongue-like is how I would describe it because it comes down and dips and is broad here. And that signal shows up at about 31, 32, 33-ish hundred inverse centimeters. And since it is broad, I would describe that as being an alcohol group due to the fact that it's broad and in the correct region, we can determine that this IR spectrum includes an alcohol functional group and not a carbonyl group. Due to the fact that it doesn't contain a carbonyl group, we can eliminate hexanal and hexanone from consideration. Due to the fact that it has an alcohol group, we can eliminate hexane from consideration because hexane would not give an alcohol signal. And we can narrow it down by process of elimination here to hexanol as the 
compound out of these four that would correspond to this IR spectrum. And this is a key type of thing that you may be asked to do on an upcoming quiz is be given an IR spectrum and as a multiple choice question, some possible compounds that IR spectrum could correspond to. And you would need to tell me which of the compounds that spectrum actually corresponded to out of that limited list of compounds. Now let's jump to another problem. This is the second practice problem on that same page of the IR spectroscopy handout. And in this problem, what we are asked to do is determine which of the four compounds, that is the four compounds shown down here at the bottom that I'm circling with my laser pointer, is shown in the IR spectrum and explain what specific signals support that particular conclusion. So looking at our IR spectrum, I return again to that business that we expected an alcohol to be broadened at about 3,300 centimeters and carbonyl groups to show up at about 1,700 inverse centimeters and be very deep and sharp signals. So looking at this spectrum and comparing it to the structures that we see down here, I see no signals in that 3300 region that are broad and therefore we can eliminate an alcohol from consideration. That makes sense because the, none of these are alcohols. So it doesn't get us super far. The signal that we see in this region is going to represent those saturated CH bonds, meaning the alkane CH bonds, since alkanes are saturated molecules. That's also not particularly useful because as we look at our structures here, we see that all of them have CH bonds in them. We come over to here, and this is going to be getting us more into a region that is useful. This is the strongest signal in the entire spectrum. It also just so happens that it shows up at about 1700 wave number, right here being 1700 wave number that we're zoning in on there. And so I would declare, since this is a very strong signal and it's at about 1700, that it corresponds to a carbonyl. And so therefore, with that in mind, what we can do is eliminate all molecules from this that do not have carbonyl groups. And so therefore, I'm gonna eliminate number three. Number three has two ether groups, where remember an ether is a carbon that's single bonded to an oxygen, and that oxygen is single bonded to another carbon. So we can eliminate option three here, and that leaves us with options one, two, and four as our possibilities. Now at this point, things get a bit dicier because what we are left with are three molecules that all have carbonyl groups and hence would all give a carbonyl signal. So we need to look a bit deeper at this spectrum to see what else we can do to distinguish between these three remaining possibilities. And for this, what I'm going to do is bring back in table 2.2 and superpose it with this information to help us in coming up with the correct response for this. So now I've brought in our table of empirically determined data that we expect for different functional groups, and we can use that as a tool to further distinguish between our remaining compounds. So looking at these, one, two, and four, one thing I notice about one that distinguishes it from two and four is that number one has an aromatic ring functional group present in it. And so what you will want to ask yourself when you see a particular functional group and you're trying to match it up with data and an IR spectrum is, are there any signals that correspond to an aromatic ring that we would expect to see in the spectrum if this spectrum does indeed correspond to compound number one? So taking a look down the chart here, I'm just looking for the word aromatic here somewhere in the information. And whoa, lo and behold, down here around 1600, we see that an aromatic carbon-carbon double bond should show a frequency of about 1600 inverse centimeters. So if indeed structure number one with the aromatic ring is what's displayed in our spectrum, then we should be able to look at 1600 wave number and find a signal. So 1600 wave number is right here. I'm highlighting it in pink. As I come up to here, I see no signal at 1600 wave number. And so based on the fact that there's no signal at 
anywhere close really to that 1600 wave number, what I can conclude is that there is no aromatic ring in this structure. And so therefore, I can eliminate answer number one because there is no support in the IR spectrum for there being an aromatic ring present. So that narrows it down to answers two, which is a ketone, and four, which is an ester. So how can we distinguish between a ketone and an ester by IR? Well, let's take a look down our chart here. So looking through our chart for ketones and esters and things that we can use to distinguish between the two, when we come down here to the 1700 region, we do see that there is expected to be a difference between ketones and esters where Ketones are expected to show up at about 1,710 inverse centimeters. Esters are at a higher frequency of around 1,735. So if we zoom in here to our structure, IR spectrum, and we look at where that signal for our carbonyl group shows up, if we follow that down to the axis, keeping in mind that this point here represents 1700 inverse centimeters. The next one over represents 1800 inverse centimeters. If we are looking at an ester, we expect it to show up at around 1735, which would be more than a quarter of the way across this region. So if we split this region in half, like I did there, that would be 1750. And then split it in half again here and here. Right there, would be 1725 inverse centimeters. And it looks like we are to the right of that. We are closer to 1700 than we are to 1725. So that leads me to conclude that this carbonyl group represents a ketone rather than representing an ester because it's closer to 1710 than it is to 1735. And 1710 is what we'd expect to be for the signal for a ketone. 1735 is what we'd expect to be the signal for an ester. And so therefore, I am going to eliminate the ester and circle ketone as our correct response here. And the ways that we rationalize that is the ketone is based on the IR spectrum signal is at about 1710 inverse centimeters, which is too low of a frequency for the ester, which is compound number four. Also, there's no aromatic, no aryl signal at approximately 1600 inverse centimeters. So compound one can't be correct. And so there's equal parts process of elimination here as is um, interpreting the data that we see. So the data that we don't see in these spectra are as important as the data that we see. So we were using signals that are not observed, such as the signal for aromatics that was not observed, as one way of ruling out compounds. And then we use signals that we do see as ways of supporting and narrowing down what compound is present in this problem. So ultimately, we determined the ketone is the best fit for the data that we have available here. So what we'll be doing as we continue our journey into linking spectral data with organic structures is we will ultimately be merging these IR data with mass spectrometry data and NMR spectroscopy data to allow us to piece together complete chemical structures for unknown organic molecules.